If you have your Bibles this morning, let me encourage you to find Mark chapter 2. That's where we're going to take our text. And then also, as we do each week, inside your uh, bulletin that we handed you when you came in, you'll find our message notes. It looks like this. And uh, some fill in the blanks and things that will help you to follow along with us. And let me encourage you to go ahead and, and take those out. It's so good to be with you this morning. And it's good to, to see everybody in the same place. We don't often have the opportunity to do that. Uh, normally we have two worship services on Sunday morning, but this being Thanksgiving weekend, we had a little bit of a, a schedule change. And uh, so we had a great uh, community group at 945, and it's good to be with you and worshiping all together this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about next week at the end of the service, but let me encourage you that we will have the same schedule next week. Next week is an important time as we come together to celebrate what God has done during the Living Stones campaign. We're going to talk about that this morning. We are actually in week six of our capital campaign emphasis called Living Stones, and we're getting close to the finish line, uh, or as Daryl Schmidt likes to call it, the starting line, right? Uh, we're not coming close to the end. We're actually coming close to the beginning, but we are finishing up the emphasis that we started five or six weeks ago, and what we've been trying to do during this time is give you some tools to help you as a church make a decision about the commitment that we've challenged you to make on a three or four year pledge to support our church as we build and as we grow and as we relocate to our new property uh, just down the road on, on Hefner. Now we've talked about over these past weeks what it means to be faithful, uh, why it's so important that we realize that God's ultimate purpose for our lives and for this church <clears throat> is eternal in nature. We have talked about commitment, how we make it, and what it requires, as well as what it produces in our life. And then last week, we talked about Thanksgiving. Uh, again, how our appreciation for all of God's blessings in our life ought to overflow into our commitment to further the kingdom of God. Now this morning, I want to talk about the trap that would be so easy for us to fall into over these next few years. Because as I've told you before, the temptation will always be strong for us to turn our focus and to turn our attention onto ourselves instead of onto those God wants us to passionately pursue. You see, we can build all the buildings, we can construct all the best facilities in the world, but if we fail to reach those who are lost and hurting for Christ, then we fail as a church. And we have failed to turn our thanksgiving into action. And we have failed to bring glory to His name. Speaking of Thanksgiving, let's take a little bit of a, a poll this morning. How many of you had a nice Thanksgiving with your family? Let, let, let's see. All right, good. So it looks like we had pretty good Thanksgiving. How many of you uh, had uh, turkey for Thanksgiving dinner? All right. How many of you did not eat turkey over Thanksgiving? I, I knew there would be a few. How many of you watched football? Uh, put up Christmas decorations. Uh, went shopping at some point over the weekend. I can tell by the look of you. I, now, here's the deal. I don't know about you, but one of my favorite times during Thanksgiving uh, is about an hour after we've eaten dinner. Uh, I'm in about my fifth hour of football at that point. Christine, a lot of times, will come in and lay down beside me on the couch and, and kind of doze a little bit. And, and it's just one of those moments. I don't know about for you, but for me, it, it's, that, it's something I always kind of think of when I think of Thanksgiving. And it's just an enjoyable time. Now, I guess this Thanksgiving... Uh, something different happened than normally happens, and that is that I, I think I must have dozed off too uh, during the game, and I, and I began to dream a little bit. And I know I was dreaming because it was the Super Bowl. Now, uh, now understand this. Um, I, I, the Super Bowl would be fine. Are you ever at a point in a dream where you actually realize, oh, wait a minute, this is a dream, this is not real? You guys ever do that? It wasn't the Super Bowl that woke me to the fact that I was dreaming. It was the fact that the Dallas Cowboys were in it. Okay? I was like, well, this is a dream, right? I mean, there's no way this could be true. Well, in this dream that I had on Thanksgiving afternoon, the Super Bowl was about to start. Uh, they had just sung the national anthem, and the fighter jets had flown over, and, and the fireworks had gone off, and the captains of each team came running out onto the field to, for the coin toss, and, and the Cowboys actually won, and they lined up to receive the kick. And unfortunately, when the Cowboys kick returner caught the ball, he was immediately just clobbered by the other team, all 11 of them, it seemed like, at the same time. That's not unusual if you've ever watched the Cowboys play football. And, and as that happened, the special teams coach comes running out on the field, 
And, and he says to his guys, what, you know, what in the world just happened out there? Nobody blocked. Why didn't you block? You almost got our guy killed. Well, 180 pound receiver says, Coach, I'll be honest with you, I'm not giving up my body for him. He's just a special teams guy. A 250 pound tight end said, look, I don't like being on special teams. Offense is my specialty. That's where I want to play. One of the reserve running backs said, Coach, he's not worth blocking for. He lost five yards. And the quarterback interrupted and said, Look, Coach, never mind. The offense can handle it. All right? And, and as we all know, off, boy, Dallas Cowboys offense, they can really handle it. And so they ran onto the field, and they got ready for the first play. And, and, and when they come out of the huddle, and the offensive coordinator signals in the play, and, and they get ready to, to, to snap the ball, and they're going to they're gonna go for the goal. But 40 seconds later, they're all still standing there in the huddle. The referee throws his yellow flag, calls for delay of game, moves them back five yards. The coach is standing on the sideline like, what in the world is going on? He sends in the next play. Same thing happens, penalty flag, five more yards. After three plays, they're backed all the way up against their own goal line. The, the, the coach signals for a timeout, and he runs onto the field. He calls the offense over, and he says, guys, what in the world is going on out there? I sent in a simple run play, and you guys haven't even snapped the ball yet. They all just kind of looked at one another. Nobody wanted to say anything. Finally, the, the lead receiver speaks up. He says, coach, I'll tell you what's wrong. I don't want to run a run play. I say we pass the ball every single time. 300-pound tackle interrupts and says, you know what? I'm tired of blocking. I want to run the ball for once. Why do you never hand the ball off to me? The fullback says, uh, on my other team, we didn't do it this way. We, we did it a different way. The quarterback says, coach, if, if you want to run the ball, why don't you run it yourself? Have you seen how hard those guys tackle on the other team? Well, the coach finally gets them to be quiet long enough to listen to him. And he says, guys, listen, this is the Super Bowl. Believe me, if I could run the ball for you, I would. But I can't. I'm the coach. I call the plays. You're the players. You have to make the plays. Quarterback says, he's just lazy. I mean, think of all the money we pay that guy. All he does is stand around over there on the sideline and call plays, and he only works half the game. The defensive coordinator does the other half, right? I mean, it seems like we can get a little bit of more out of a guy that we pay so much. Finally, the coach says, listen, I want you to stop the arguing. I want you to stop the whining. I want you to stop the blaming. This is the big game. Guys, most people never even get the chance to play in this game, much less to win it. Now, let me tell you what's going to happen. You guys are going to get your act together. You're going to go out there, and you're going to win this Super Bowl. Well, the players kind of mumble to themselves until finally one player says, but coach, how are we supposed to play? We don't agree on anything. The coach says, here's what you're going to do. You're going to stop your arguing about all this little stuff, and you're going to focus on just three things. I want you to be thinking about three things. You're going to know your mission, you're going to know your role, and you're going to know our strategy. He says, first of all, you're going to know your mission. Offense, your mission is to get this ball into that end zone as many times as you possibly can. Don't worry about our defensive strategy. Don't worry about what routine the cheerleaders are doing. All right, know your mission. Get the ball into the end zone. Secondly, you need to know your role. Linemen, you weigh 300 pounds for a reason. You're hard to get around. Your role is to block. We do not need you to run the ball. If we did, we'd make you lose 100 pounds and do wind sprints all day long. But that's not your role. Your role is to knock people down. Your role is to clear a path. It's different from running the ball, but it is just as important. Running backs, you're some of the fastest players on the field. That's why we give you the ball. When you get it, run like your life depends on it. Finally, he says, you've got to also, finally, you've got to know the strategy that we're trying to employ. See, some teams are run and gun. They put five receivers on the field all at the same time. They throw the ball in every play. Other teams are, are more ground and pound, three yards in a cloud of dust. Over and over and over and over they run the ball. But guess what? That's not our strategy. We're a balanced offense. Sometimes we're going to run. 
Sometimes we're going to throw, but we are going to stick with our strategy. Well, as the game went on, the blockers blocked, the runners ran, the receivers received, the coaches coached. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't pretty. They had some injuries. They had some penalties. When all was said and done, they won the game. And they did it because they stayed focused on those three important things. They knew their mission, they knew their role, and they knew their strategy. Now, I believe that the same can be true for Oakdale Baptist Church. As we enter the first of these next few years of preparing to, to build and to move, we too can be victorious in accomplishing the vision that God has given us as a church if we are committed to the right game plan. This morning I want to read you a story about some guys who actually worked together as a team to complete their mission. And it was a whole lot more important than some football game. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to parallel their game plan with our game plan as we prepare to enter a building program some point in the future. And I'll just tell you right now, as, as we work through these last five, six weeks, uh, we've, we've talked about tools and we've talked about principles and we've talked about ideas. And this morning, it's going to be a little bit different. We're going to, I'm going to be just as practical as I can possibly be. You won't hear a message like this very often. Okay? So prepare yourself for something a little bit different. This is Mark chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. If you've got it there, uh, you'll also see it on the screen behind me. Here's what it says. <clears throat> a few days later, when Jesus in, uh, again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no one left, not even outside, there was no room left, rather, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then they lowered the mat that the man was laying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. All right, so there are three questions that, that we're going to ask this morning in terms of the game plan that we just read versus the, the building game plan that we have to be able to employ as a church. First of all, we need to ask, what is our mission? Write that word down if you would. What is our mission? What is it ultimately that we are trying to accomplish as a church? Now understand, a football team's mission is to get the football into the end zone. The men that we just read about, their mission was to get their friend to Jesus. And I want you to notice that they did not let any obstacles stop them from completing their mission. I mean, the house was full, there was no room for them to come in, but they didn't just feel sorry for themselves and quit when at first things didn't work out the way they expected. They didn't just drop him off the curb and say, hey, you know, good luck, uh, hope, hope you can find a way in when they realized it wasn't going to be as simple as just walking through the front door. One way or another, they were going to get their friend to Jesus. So what is our mission? What is our ultimate goal? I want you to listen to this. Our mission, a great commitment to the great commandment and the Great Commission produces a great church. Now, I didn't make that up. You guys could probably tell. I'm not that smart. But let me say it to you again. A great commitment to the Great Commandment and the Great Commission produces a great church. Now, let's break that down. What is, what is the Great Commandment? Do you remember when Jesus was asked about this? Lord, somebody said, what's the greatest of the Ten Commandments? Of all the, the, the rules in the Bible, the commands that we're told to do and not do, what's the, the most important one? And Jesus said this in Luke 10. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Now add to that the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The great commandment and the great commission. You put them together and what do you get? 
a church that is victorious for God's kingdom. Now, how does that impact the way we give? How does that impact the way we build? Well, first of all, it keeps us focused on the fact that we, what we are trying to accomplish is eternal in nature. In terms of giving, it motivates us to get started, to take the first steps, to give generously. Because just like the friends of this paralyzed man, we understand that what we're trying to accomplish here, it's big, it's important. And then once we begin to give generously and, we, and we've had a great commitment to the great commandment and a great commission, that ensures that we will finish the job that we've started. Has anybody here ever lost a piece of important jewelry? Have you ever done that? It'll drive you crazy, won't it? To lose something that's important to you. You know, if you were to misplace a piece of costume jewelry, that's really no big deal. I mean, we can go get another one of those, right? But what if it were a diamond wedding ring? That would get us moving in the right direction, wouldn't it? If that was the case, we would get on our hands and knees and we would start looking for that thing. And then because of the investment of time and of money and because it, of what it means to us, we'd be motivated to keep looking until we found it. Well, when we give, we must give with the right mission on our heart and in our mind. When we build, we should build with the right mission in our heart and in our mind because a great commitment to the great command and the great commission produces a great church. Here's question number two. What is our role? Will you write that word in? What is our role? Remember I said that in football, different players have different roles. Offensive linemen, they're big and they're built and they're trained for blocking. Running backs, they're a lot smaller. They're very fast and they're elusive. Now, they all have the same mission. They're supposed to get the ball into the end zone, but they have different roles to play. Think back to Mark chapter 2. You can count on it. These men, they had one goal in mind, didn't they? But it required them to take on different roles in order to accomplish that common goal. Some of them had to carry. Some of them had to climb. Some had to pull or hold or balance or tear or dig or lower. We don't know how many men were a part of this team. The Bible doesn't say. But you can take it to the bank. In this group of men, there were leaders and there were followers. The Bible does say that there were at least four of them who were carrying the man on a mat. But that means that there were others who were there with them. And, and on this day, you can count on it. The leaders led and the followers followed. You know how I know? Because they were effective. Do you know what direction a, a raft floats? if five people are rowing in five different directions? No direction, right? Or it just goes whichever way the water takes them despite whatever their goal might be. Well, these men had faith in their team. So imagine if they had all stood there in front of that house arguing about how to get their friend inside. Hey, I have an idea. Let's just burst through the wall. Let's just knock the wall down. No, 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 let's don't do that. Let's set it on fire. That'll get everybody moving, right? We'll definitely have a space if we do that. Now, is that what they did? No, they let the leaders lead and the followers follow. And each person accepted and embraced the role that made their team the most effective. How about you? What's your role going to be in this fundraising effort at Oakdale? What, what, what's going to be your role in a building program someday? You know, when we were dividing up responsibilities in the planning stages of the fundraising campaign. And I mentioned this a few weeks ago. We had a lot of different roles that needed to be filled. We needed some people to do different things like design brochures and meet with families and be prayer warriors and etch stones and crosses and create PowerPoint slides and do administrative tasks, put together a video. The list goes on and on and on and on of the roles that needed to be filled. And as we went from person to person asking for help, different people would say, you know, I'm not really comfortable talking to people. I have no idea how to design a brochure, but I know exactly where to find a couple of hundred stones and exactly how to etch them. I could do that. Somebody else would say, you know, I, I couldn't put together a PowerPoint presentation if my life depended on it, right? And, and you do not want me in charge of keeping administrative stuff organized. Definitely not my thing, but I love talking to people. And I love sharing my heart about things that I'm passionate about. And I'm telling you, one by one, 
each of those roles got filled by people who knew and understood and accepted their role in this campaign. And you know what your role is? Right now, it's to pray. It's to pray about it and make a decision about your family's pledge. Then it will be your role to be faithful to that commitment that you've made over these next few years, all the while encouraging others to keep their commitment as well. And when new people come, when new people join the church, it, it will be your responsibility to find ways to communicate the vision to them that God has given us as a church and what it is that He wants us to accomplish. Over the next few years, there will be many roles to play for all of us. Many will be different, but they will all be important. Will you write that in? Our roles will be different, but they'll all be important. We've got to know our mission. We have to understand our role. Here's the third question that, that I want us to ask as we, as we look at this story, as we look into the future. What exactly is our strategy? What is our strategy? Now, let's start with this. What is a strategy? A strategy is just a specific way of approaching how to accomplish your mission. And while your mission is set in stone, your strategies are, are very flexible. Uh, in football, some teams throw the ball on every play. Some run almost every play. Same mission, different strategies. The men who brought their friend to Jesus, what, what was their strategy? Their goal was to get him inside the house, right? But their strategy was to climb up on the roof. I mean, imagine this. Climb up on the roof, tear a hole in it, lower their friend down into the house to where Jesus was. Now, imagine what that must have looked like from inside the house. There's Jesus teaching and talking and, and people are gathered around listening to him. All of a sudden they start to hear something happening in the roof above and it, it tears open and they see a couple of heads look down from the roof. And then all of a sudden somebody starts being lowered down on a mat in front of them. That was their strategy. That was how they determined was the best way for them to figure out how to get him in the house. Now, let me ask you this. Is that the only way they could have got him in the house? Is that the only strategy? that would have worked? No, there were dozens of strategies that might have worked. That's just the one that they settled on. And all it really took was a reasonable plan and everybody's agreement to follow it. Did you know that the same is true in church? The Bible says that the church has five purposes that we're supposed to accomplish. Worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. We talk about those all the time. We teach on those all the time. That is our goal, to accomplish those purposes. And, and you know what? That's pretty set in stone. We're not going to go around changing those things every month, are we? We're not going to go around deciding, you know what? Worship's not important. Let's, let's find something else to be important. You know what? Discipleship doesn't really matter. Let's find a different purpose to accomplish. No, that's set in stone. Now, our strategies, on the other hand, they're pretty flexible. Our strategies, in fact, they have to change. You can't do it the same way over and over and always expect it to keep working. See, you never adjust your mission. You never adjust your purpose. But sometimes you have to change your strategies to meet the changing needs of a changing culture. Uh, as an example, we used to have an organ on the stage. How many people remember that? Raise your hand if you remember the organ. Okay? If you remember the organ, point to where it was. Some of you remember the wrong thing, apparently. Uh, yeah, but, but, but you're right. Right over here is where the organ's set, right? Now, we don't have an organ anymore. Why is that? Organs used to be a very popular instrument in the church. Why do we not have an organ sitting right over there like we used to? Is it because we hate organs? No, we don't hate organs. I bet we have people here who love organ music, right? You won't believe this, but I've been in some of the most beautiful cathedrals in the United States. And I'll tell you right now, one of my favorite things to hear is the incredible pipe organs. I love that. It's amazing when you can feel the pipe organ being played. So why don't we have an organ? Well, it's because our culture has changed. Organ music no longer holds the same place in our culture. It's not that it's bad. It's not that it's wrong. It's just different. And guess what? It may come back one day. Things come back all the time. You may be surprised to look up one day and, and see an organ playing in the church. 
There's nothing bad. There's nothing wrong. It's just different. For now, our strategy is to use more contemporary instruments in leading worship. Now, again, the purpose doesn't change. What's our purpose? To worship God, right? To praise God. But our strategies for that, sometimes they change. Another thing about strategy is, is that it can be different from what other people do. In other words, we don't all have to have the same strategy all the time. In some churches, one of the five purposes uh, will sort of trump all the other purposes. Maybe it's worship. And so in that church, all of their time and all of their energy and all of their resources go into the worship service. And they will have great participation and they'll have great passion for worship. But there, there really won't be a lot of ministry or fellowship that, that takes place. Another church might focus exclusively on evangelism and, and they won't really worry about the other purposes. So reaching out to the unchurched and, and reaching out to lost people, that'll be a huge priority in that church. But, but maybe it'll be hard to find discipleship taking place there. At Oakdale, our overall strategy is to be as balanced as we can in all of the five purposes of the church with an emphasis on fellowship and relationship. You guys write that into your notes? Our strategy is to be as balanced as we can in all the five purposes of the church, but I, we will admit there is an emphasis for us on fellowship, on, on the relationship part of church. And then as you drill down into the different individual purposes, we have different strategies that we employ for each one of them. We approach discipleship differently uh, on Sunday morning, for example, than we do on Wednesday nights. We deal with the difficulties of, of healthy fellowship and relationships in a growing church by constantly dividing up into smaller groups. All the time we're trying to do that. Now, will we always pursue those purposes in exactly the same way? No. Sometimes the community around a church changes, and so its strategies have to change. You'll almost always get different strategies when you change pastors or staff. Don't get any ideas, all right? Uh, our mission, our mission stays the same, but our strategies, they do change and they adjust over time. Now, how does that apply? I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. How does that apply to a, a new facility, to building a new church facility? You say, well, I couldn't have anything to do with the way you, you build a church facility. You get a picture, you know what you want, you put it up, it's got bricks, it's got metal, it's got a steeple, it's got, it's got it looks like a church, right? I mean, you just do it. You just do what a church looks like. That's not, that's not how it works. It means for us that any new facility that we ever build, it's got to be purposeful and it's got to be flexible. That means that, that we need facilities that allow us to accomplish the five purposes, but they've got to be flexible enough to change occasionally. New facilities, they also have to be practical. See, we want, to, we want to accomplish ministry in these buildings, not monuments to ourselves. We need spaces where we can have things like Mother's Day Out or, or preschool, before and after school programs, neighborhood association meetings, a, a community storm shelter, weddings and funerals, and, and all kinds of ministry that can take place in the church. Finally, we need to make sure that new facilities reflect our priorities as a church. So we need space to accomplish each of the five purposes, but we probably ought to build with some added emphasis on what? On relationships and on fellowship. You know what my favorite part? How many of you have seen the renderings that we have of, of, of a possible future church? Have you guys seen the pictures? You look at that, and, and, and it's, it's so neat to be able to see it because it gives you an idea. I can, I can envision that. I can kind of dream of what that might look like. Let me tell you what my favorite part of all that is. My favorite part of those renderings is the sort of the fellowship uh, foyer area in, in that church. And, and it's a sort of a, a, a place in the middle that serves as a hub for all the separate buildings that, that would be built. Whereas now we barely have room to move around one another in the foyer. In this new facility, there will be thousands of square feet for doing just that. For couches and chairs and spaces for small groups to meet if they want to. All of it connected to a, a kitchen. So whether we're serving a Wednesday night meal or an event like our Thanksgiving dinner that we had last week, 
there'd be room for everybody to be a part right there where we meet. See, when the day comes, we will build facilities that are practical, flexible, and purposeful so that we can accomplish the mission that God has given us as a church to reach the lost and to reach hurting people. See, every room that's constructed, every chair that's purchased, every wall that's painted has the potential to impact eternity as we, just like those guys from Mark 2, bring our friends and our family and our neighbors into God's presence, not because He lives in a building, but because He lives in us. What's our mission? A great commitment to the great commandment and a great, the great commission produces a great church. What's our role? Our roles are all going to be different, but they will all be important. There will be hundreds of them. Some of them will be similar, others completely different, but they're all incredibly important. Finally, what's our strategy? Our strategy is to be as balanced as we possibly can in all the five purposes of the church, maybe with an emphasis on fellowship and relationships. We've got to fulfill the five purposes of the church in ways that are biblical, relevant, authentic, and heartfelt. And I'm telling you, if we can do these things, I want you to think of all the people that can be healed spiritually, relationally, even physically, forgiven of sin, and saved for eternity. You know what? I believe that is God's game plan for Oakdale Baptist Church. Now, here's something that's interesting. As I think about that, as we talk about that, we kind of dream for the future, I have no idea when that's going to happen. Do you? You say, yeah, it's going to happen at the beginning of the summer, right? We're going to start digging dirt, and we're going to start laying down stuff. You know what? If the money comes in, you're right, we will. But I really have no idea. Here's something else. I have no idea if I'll even ever be here to ever see it. But guess what? It doesn't matter. It's not about me, is it? As we plan, as we commit, as we sacrifice, it's not about what I'm going to be a part of or even what you're going to be a part of. My responsibility is to God. My responsibility is to the people who are not in this room, people who are out there that we don't even know yet, who are lost, who are hurting, who are struggling, who are seeking God, and they need God, and they need their relationship with Him and with you, and they need the same things that you needed when you walked through the crowded foyer of Oakdale Baptist Church, right? That is who we build for. That is who we design for. And it doesn't even matter to me if I ever get to see it or if I ever get to be a part of it doesn't change one thing. And I don't know about you, but for my family, we've made that commitment. And we're ready to give and to support and to be a part of something. Again, who knows if we'll ever even get to see. I believe that's God's game plan for us as a church as we build into the future. Now, those are important decisions to make, and they're hard decisions to make. They don't just come easily. It takes some time. It takes some prayer. It takes some thought. It takes some consideration. We've had five weeks to think about it and pray about it and consider it, and now our time is coming to an end. And next Sunday morning, we're going to come back together, and we're going we're gonna to sing, and we're going to celebrate, and we're going to share, and we're going to talk about what God has done. And, and trust me, God has done some incredible things. And I'll remind you, it's not about the money, okay? We're not going to get up here and we're not just going to talk about we've raised this many dimes and this many quarters and this many dollar bills. It's not about that. You know what it's about? It's about an investment that we get to make in God's kingdom. And that is something we're celebrating. So next Sunday morning, we're going to come here, we're going to celebrate, we're going to sing and worship together at 11 o'clock. And we're going to find out how God has been at work at Oakdale Baptist Church. And we're going to dream of the future that God has for us as well. The key is this. It, it's no good to simply celebrate and to simply dream. We've got to follow God's game plan. Amen? It's important that we do this with purpose. It's important that we have a goal to accomplish and that we're not all trying to go in different 
direction. So, as we think about that next week, many of you have not yet made that commitment. You're still thinking about it. You're still praying about it. You're still trying to decide as a family, how do we do this? By the way, if you're a guest this morning, if you've been a guest over the past six, six weeks, I apologize to you. It is kind of fun watching the church members squirm, you have to admit, right? It, it is kind of fun to be the one who's looking around going, yeah, he's talking to you, buddy, not me. Okay? If you're a guest this morning, listen, we're not talking to you in terms of what we expect or what we're challenging you to do. But understand this, if you're a guest this morning, you're exactly what our goal is. Do you understand that? You're the reason. You're the reason we're here. And you're the reason that we're going we're to pray hard and we're going to dream big and we're going to make the commitment and with God's help, we're going to win the game in terms of the mission that God has given us. I want you guys, if you would, to bow your heads. This will be our, our, really our last opportunity together before next week for you to continue to seek and pray and, and search and consider and, and try to understand what it is that God is, is the way He's trying to lead you. If you as a family are a part of Oakdale in some way, connected in some way, whether you're a church member or not, but you are a regular attender, you are here, this is your church. I want to challenge you right now if you haven't made a commitment yet. I want to challenge you during this time to do just what I said, to seek, to pray, to consider. God, will you just show me what you want? Show me the role that I will play. I know what my mission is. I think I understand what our strategy is. God, show me my role. Show me my family's role, how we get to be a part of investing. Not just for the future, but for eternity. And as God goes to work in your heart, I would challenge you to respond to Him. We're going to take some time this morning to do that, to seek and let God speak. Heavenly Father, I thank You for the way that you, that you do go to work in us. God, sometimes it's really hard when we know You're saying something to us. It can be really hard when we feel like You're poking us in the heart. But God, there's almost nothing better than that moment when we obeyed You. There's almost nothing better than that moment when we say yes. When we say, I do, we will. With your help, we can. So God, just speaking on behalf of this church, I want to say, I want to welcome you to speak into our heart. I want to invite you to poke at the heart of Oakdale Baptist Church. Just show us what you want. And then it'll be up to us as to whether or not we're going to be obedient to it or not. God, there are, are some here this morning who aren't part of Oakdale Baptist Church, but they're not here by accident. This morning's certainly not a throwaway for them. You brought them here on purpose. And as incredible as it may seem, I believe that you may have brought them here to hear what we're thinking about and what we're struggling with and what we're dealing with somehow you'd take that and you'd use that to show them their need for you and their need for a church family and their need for what you had to offer here at Oak Hill Baptist Church. God, will you speak to their heart as well? And as you speak, may we humble ourselves, may we surrender to you, may we allow you to be at work in us. Whatever that means, whatever it takes. I love you, Heavenly Father. I love you. I celebrate the work that you're doing in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.